This is my first video update coming to you from Larnica, Cyprus on this Friday morning. Let's talk about some news. And let's start things off with what is going on in the United States. A quick update with the vote for Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy. He has uh, tried 11 times now to be voted Speaker of the House and he has failed all those 11 times. Eventually he will get there. I believe he will get there just because there's no viable uh, competitor. There's no one that has stepped up to challenge him, like to seriously come to, uh, come to the front and say, look, I want this job as well. I want to be Speaker of the House. I'm a viable contender. Here are my qualifications. This is why I want it. Vote for me. No one has really done that so far, and it doesn't look like anyone is going to do that. Um, so eventually, McCarthy is, uh, is going to become Speaker of the House, in my opinion, I imagine. Unless he withdraws, he'll, uh, he'll be Speaker of the House. All he really has to do is to just listen to uh, these 20 or so Republican holdouts, listen to what they have to say, negotiate with them, sit down, negotiate, uh, give them some of the things that they're asking for. At the end of the day, what they're asking for, the changes that they would, that they would like to have happen in the House of Representatives is going to actually make the House of Representatives more representative. <laughs> it can actually improve the way Congress works. Why McCarthy does, want, does not want to give these concessions speaks to the fact that, uh, that he is a swamp creature. I mean, they're, they, are, they are having to purge through humiliation, by humiliating this man, they are purging the swampness <laughs> out of him. <laughs> they are trying to purge the uniparty rhino swampness out of him because he refuses to, uh, to concede to some of the issues that these uh, Republicans are, are asking for. And um, they are very reasonable, very logical things that they would like to have happen in the House, changes that they would like to have McCarthy implement, which would make the, uh, the House of Representatives a better, more functioning uh, institution, a more functioning arm of the, uh, of the US government. And he refuses to do these things, which tells me how much of a swamp creature, how much of a uniparty guy he really is. But eventually, through this humiliation process, I hope that he will, uh, he will concede. He will give. Uh, he will give some of the some of the things that people like Matt Gates and Chip Roy are asking for. He will give them some of those things, and hopefully, he becomes a better uh, speaker, a better eventual speaker of the House, and the House of Representatives becomes a a better um, chamber. Hopefully that is, that is what's going to happen. The fact that this is taking a couple of days is not a big deal. You know, you're looking to become the third most powerful person in the U.S. government. So it should take a couple of days. In my opinion, it should take a couple of weeks. This shouldn't be a, a coronation. This shouldn't be a birthright. This should be a hard process. This should be difficult. To become Speaker of the House it should be a super difficult thing. And there should be a lot of pushback and a lot of negotiations and a lot of give and take. You are, you are trying to become the third most powerful person in the United States. This should not be an easy process and it should be a humiliating and humbling process. That's what's going to make the house better. That's what's going to make the house more representative. And that's what's going to make the speaker a better speaker. So anyway, with that said, let's uh, let's take a walk through the through the city of Larnaca. You can see the, the Christmas tree right there. New apartments being built. Wow, these apartments, they've won the European Property Awards. Not bad. <laughs> Not bad. Anyway, um, since we have a Christmas tree right in back of us, tomorrow is uh, Christmas for... Uh, for Russian Orthodox, for Serbian Orthodox, I believe for, um, what else? Uh, Ethiopia, is Ethiopian uh, Orthodox? Are they celebrating on the seventh as well? I'm not sure, but uh, definitely Russian and Serbian is celebrating Christmas tomorrow. And uh, 
Patriarch Kirill for the, uh, for the Russian Orthodox Church. He said that uh, it would be good to have one day, a one day truce, a ceasefire for one day as, uh, as the Russian Orthodox faith celebrates Christmas. And Vladimir Putin said, okay. And the Russian military said, okay. One day, a secession to hostilities. And they floated that proposal out to, uh, to Ukraine and the collective West. And what did Ukraine and the collective West say? They said, no, across the board. Actually, they flipped out. They had a meltdown. The EU came out with statements. The Biden White House came out with statements. Uh, of course, everyone in the Ukraine government, everyone in the Ukraine government came out with statements. Uh, and everybody, everybody in the collective West came out with a statement and said, this is a cynical act. Russia is trying to uh, use this one day. They're going to use a one day secession and hostilities to rearm and re-equip. <laughs> so, I mean, they, they just said no. They said no. We don't agree. No, no truce, no ceasefire. Nothing like that is going to happen. And, uh, and they all came out with statements saying how Putin is trying to use this time. This is a trick. And he's trying to use this time to, uh, to rearm and to launch a big offensive. And I find this really, really funny that the collective West, the European Union, the United States, the Alensky regime, that they are saying that Russia is using this ceasefire, this Christmas ceasefire as a trick. This is coming from the same people, the same people that duped Russia with Minsk one and Minsk two. The same people that are now actually boasting about it. They're boasting about the fact that they lied with regards to Minsk one and Minsk two. And now they're saying that Russia is, is trying to use a ceasefire during Christmas as a way to, uh, to rearm. What did Merkel say? We use the Minsk agreement to buy time. <laughs> That's what they're saying now Russia is trying to do with this one day, this one day Christmas truce. <laughs> oh boy. These are the same people that blew up a Nord Stream pipeline. <laughs> and they're the ones, and they're the ones now that are saying that Russia is, uh, is using this as a trick. Let's walk this way. Let's walk through the Larnica cafes. <laughs> the Larnica Christmas cafes here. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> oh boy. Oh boy, oh boy. So Elensky, he had the, uh, I think he had the best, the best line with regards to this Christmas truce because Alensky, not only did he refuse to, uh, ooh, a lot of people today, a lot of people at the cafes. Today is a holiday in, uh, in Cyprus and in Greece, actually, the 6th of, uh, of January. So a lot of people are out now. Getting an early start to the day. So, uh, Alensky, he, um, he had this to say with regards to the Christmas truce. He actually called for regime change. That's the one thing that he called for. He said, uh, this is a cynical act from Putin. He's using this to rearm. He's going to use this one Christmas, Christmas Day truce as cover to rearm. And then he called for regime change. Let's see here. In a video message to Ukrainians, Elensky, Biden calls him Elensky, but we'll call him Elensky. <laughs> Elensky said in a video message that he had offered a peace plan to Moscow in December, starting with the withdrawal of all Russian troops from territories claimed by Kiev on Christmas. Quote, now they want to use Christmas as cover to stop the advance of our boys in, in Donbass for a bit and bring up their equipment, ammunition, and mobilize troops to the front, Alensky said, claiming this will only result in more Russian casualties. <laughs> I have to stop here. What is he talking about? Our Ukrainian advance. 
What is he talking about, Ukrainian advances? All right, uh, everyone in the world knows how the Kremlin uses ceasefires to continue the war with renewed vigor, Alensky said in the video message. What is needed for the conflict to end, he argued, is to overthrow President Putin. So he's talking about Ukrainian advances. He's talking about regime change in Russia. Ugh. Oh boy. Meanwhile, as Russia is advancing and Russian military is reported to be in the city center of Solidar, Collective West Media is now confirming that Russia is advancing in, uh, in Bakhmut as well. They are actually admitting to this as Russia does advance. The, uh, the collective West, well, they are pouring more weapons into Ukraine. And we have now Germany getting in on the action. We talked about the Bradleys from Biden. He's going to be sending 50 Bradleys and uh, 3 billion in military equipment to Ukraine. This is actually one of the biggest uh, tranches of uh, military aid that Ukraine has gotten. Since the beginning of the conflict, three billion in weapons. That is what Biden is going to commit to. Fifty Bradleys. Macron is is sending light tanks, or as Brian Berletic at the New Atlas describes them, vehicles with wheels, <laughs> which is just a great way to to, to look at these uh, these light tanks that Macron is is uh, sending to Ukraine. Actually, they've already they've already arrived. I've seen photos of these, uh, these vehicles with wheels, these tanks with wheels arriving in, uh, in Kiev, in Ukraine already. So that was quick. And um, we have Germany now. Germany is going to be sending, well, actually they're considering sending Leopard, Leopard heavy tanks, which is interesting. Schultz had a phone call with, uh, with Biden. And after that phone call, he decided that it's time for Germany now to send weapons. And remember, Germany's excuse was always, we're not going to be the first one to send tanks. So then Macron sent what he calls light tanks. And now Germany is able to send uh, leopard, leopard tanks to, uh, to Ukraine. So that is what uh, Germany is looking to do. They are going to be sending leopard tanks to, uh, to Alensky. And what else is Germany going to uh, to be sending? I don't know. Are these Leopard tanks going to make any difference? These Leopard 2 tanks? Heavy tanks. Martyr. Martyr BMPs as well. And, and a Patriot air defense battery. So Biden calls Schultz. He says Macron is going to uh, send light tanks. So now Schultz... You're going to have to send tanks. And Schultz said, okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> if Macron is going to send light tanks, I'll send some Leopard 2s <laughs> and a Patriot defense system. Biden, by the way, was giving a speech and uh, <laughs> the other day, and he said that the Patriot systems, they are working and the Russians are starting to realize it. They function well and help a lot. <laughs> I don't think like a Patriot system has arrived yet in uh, Ukraine, has it? I don't think it has. I think actually we're far off from the Patriot system arriving in Ukraine. But Biden's like, yeah, the, the Patriot systems are working well. <laughs> oh, Bidenopolis, Bidenopolis, Greece's favorite son. He has no idea what's going on, does he? So yeah, Germany is going to be sending all kinds of stuff to Ukraine now as well. Didn't, uh, didn't the analysts tell us just like a month ago, weren't they saying that uh, Ukraine has, has captured so many Russian tanks over this conflict? In the, tenth, ten, in the 10 months of this conflict, Ukraine now has more tanks than what it started off with. Wasn't that the narrative that we were getting from all of the 
super smart analysts. Just two weeks ago, I was watching a video of some guy who also has kind of like a walking in in nature kind of uh, geopolitical analysis show. And he was talking about how uh, Ukraine is going to easily win this conflict. Come May, Ukraine is going to crush the Russian military because Ukraine now has more tanks than when it started this, uh, this conflict because they've captured thousands and thousands of Russian tanks and equipment. And, uh, you know, they've just got all of this, this hardware and all of these vehicles that, you know, they're, they can't lose. So if they've got all of these vehicles, all of these tanks, all of this equipment that they've captured from the siege of Kiev, remember that? The siege of Kiev and all of these things. Why, why do they need light tanks? Why do they need Bradleys? I thought the narrative was that during the siege of Kiev, Ukraine captured a thousand Russian tanks. That's what the collective West media, that's what the analysts were telling us. So then why do they need all of these things? <laughs> ah, could it be that Russia has destroyed all of Ukraine's tanks? Could it be that Ukraine really didn't capture all of those tanks? Could it be that there was really no siege of Kiev? Could it be that these were all lies and propaganda? Like when Zelensky gets on, uh, on TV and gives a video message and says that uh, Ukraine troops are advancing and that's why Russia wants this Christmas truce. All right, so, um, oh boy, oh boy. I'm trying to think if I have any other stories. Yeah, I do. I do have another story here and then we're gonna do two clown worlds. This has been kind of a, kind of a jumbled up video. I don't know why. I think I'm distracted a little bit today for some reason. So, um, Lithuania or Latvia? Latvia. Latvia arrested Marat Kassam, the editor-in-chief for uh, Sputnik in Lithuania, the Sputnik news uh, channel in Lithuania. Actually, let's go down this way. Let's go down the dark alleys. So they arrested Sputnik, which is um, part of part of Russian state media, RT. It's it's kind of the it's the Russian answer to to Reuters. That's the best way to describe Sputnik. It's the Russian answer to Reuters, a news agency that puts out uh, syndicated news like Reuters, and that that's its purpose. Anyway, um, and they have offices all over the world, right? So this guy, Mr. Kassam, Marat Kassam, I believe he is, I believe he is Latvian, if I'm not mistaken. And he was the editor-in-chief of the Lithuanian, okay, the Lithuanian branch of the Russian Sputnik news agency. Okay, so he's Latvian, and he was the editor-in-chief of the Lithuanian branch of the news agency but he was uh, arrested in Latvia. So he went home to Latvia, works in Lithuania, editor-in-chief of Sputnik, went home to Latvia for the holidays, probably for Christmas, whatever, and he was arrested. He is accused of breaching EU sanctions and has been charged with espionage, Sputnik reports. So... They are arresting journalists now. Seizing assets, arresting journalists. Oh, it's going to take us right to the beach. This is the path that the EU is moving towards. Estonia is seizing assets. Latvia is arresting journalists. Maria Zakharova is demanding his release of course. She's calling on international organizations to demand his release. Didn't we go through this with Brittany Griner? Didn't we just go through all of this? If we seize, we're going to seize your people, Russia, and 
you can't do anything about it. So the Russians said, okay, well, if you're gonna seize our people, well, we'll seize uh, your people. I mean, we, we've just gone through this. This is not gonna end well for, uh, for the EU and for Europe. And I have to ask myself, is Russia, is Russia going to retaliate in kind? I mean, is this where we're taking things? You're blowing up pipelines. You're, uh, you're seizing assets. You're arresting journalists. This is the collective West. This is the human rights collective West. And Russia has a right to retaliate, don't they? I mean, in all fairness, don't they have a right to retaliate? And how is, how is that retaliation going to look? Is Russia going to start arresting journalists, BBC journalists in Russia? Is this, is this where we're heading towards? My point is that this is where the EU, this is where the collective West is pushing Russia towards. This is what they want to see happen. They want to arrest this guy because they want Russia to retaliate in kind so that then they can come out and say, you see, you see how Putin treats journalists? Because no one's going to report on, uh, on this story. No one cares about the Sputnik editor in chief being arrested in Latvia. No one cares about that because he's a Putin troll. He's a Putin spy. What about the CIA spies and the CIA trolls and the Biden, Biden trolls and the Biden bots? <laughs> I mean, it's just so, it's crazy, man. It's crazy. Guy's a journalist. He works for state media, Russian state media, Sputnik. And that's his job. That's it. Anyway, uh, that's what's going on there. This is... Uh, this is once again a really, really bad uh, road that the EU has taken. The masks are coming off and we're seeing the true nature of, uh, of the collective West. Especially of the European Union. No surprise that this is coming from a Baltic state. Estonia is seizing assets. I talked about that yesterday. Latvia is arresting journalists. The neocons are putting the Baltic states up to this. They're saying, we want you to provoke Russia because we want Russia to retaliate. We want Russia to retaliate because then we can demonize Putin some more. No one's going no one's gonna to talk about Estonia seizing assets. No one's going to talk about the European Union arresting journalists. No one talks about Assange. No one talks about Assange in the collective West. Poking the bear. Anyway, let's do two, uh, two clown worlds. The first clown world has to do with CNN, since we're talking about journalists. Adam Kinzinger, the guy that actually believed the ghost of Kiev, the, uh, the Republican in name only that sat on the January 6th committee and, uh, and absolutely hates Trump, despises Trump. This guy is now going to be a CNN analyst, a CNN contributor. A <laughs> big surprise. So he didn't even bother running again for his uh, seat in Congress because he knew he was going to get pummeled. He was going to lose. And uh, so CNN has given him a job now as an analyst. You see how that works? He's been rewarded. What have I been saying on this channel for, for a long time now? You either get a book deal or you become... Uh, you get a show on CNN or MSNBC, you, you become a contributor, whatever it is, you're gonna get rewarded for, for doing what you did for the deep state. And Kissinger, you know, he, he threw away his whole congressional career in order to, uh, to prop up the, the deep state narrative. He goes super hard on Ukraine like super hard. He totally bought into the ghost of Kiev. That just shows you this guy's intelligence. So he bought into the ghost of Kiev big time. He, uh, 
He's all about sending as many billions as uh, as the U.S. has to Ukraine. I mean, just whatever, whatever the U.S. has, send it to Ukraine. That's his line. And he uh, he did everything he could to go after Trump, and he's getting rewarded now. So you're not going to become a congressman anymore because everybody despises you. Uh, everyone with with a rational, <laughs> you know, head with a rational mind. They despise you, but don't worry about it, Mr. Kinzinger. You're going to, uh, to become an analyst on CNN. That is how it works. It's not a book deal. It's something in the media. That's why CNN and MSNBC, they don't really need to make profits. They don't really need to make money. They're not there to be profitable businesses. They serve a different purpose. And another clown world is uh, Hillary Clinton. Oh boy, Hillary Clinton. Can't get enough of her. She has a new job. She has now been given the title of professor. Professor Hillary. <laughs> professor Hillary Clinton at Columbia University in New York, where she will instruct students on public affairs and global politics. Oh boy, she is going to be appointed a professor of practice at Columbia School of International and Public Affairs beginning in February. Her work will cover a variety of major initiatives, especially those focusing on global politics and policy and on supporting female leaders, according to Columbia, Columbia University's president, Lee C. Bollinger. Clinton commented on this professor professorship appointment hailing the university for helping to address some of the world's most pressing challenges and for its commitment to educating the next generation of policy leaders. She's thrilled to join the community, she said. Professor Hillary. Yeah, I guess she could teach classes in destroying countries, color revolutions, regime change. Today's lesson, students, is on regime change how you can destroy a country like Libya in a couple of weeks. Assassinate its leader, sodomize him, assassinate him, have it on video, and then go on 60 Minutes or CBS News and say, we came, we saw he died. <laughs> that, is, that is what Hillary Clinton can, can teach those young minds in Colombia. God help us. God help us that these... Uh, that these students are gonna be exposed to this, to this person. All right, that is the video, everybody. It's been a kind of, uh, like I said, a little bit of a rambling video, but uh, it's okay, we got through it. <laughs> we got through it and we'll end it to there, theduran.locals.com. Duran shop, 10% off, use the code good day. We are on Rockfin as well, and uh, that is it. From Larnica, Cyprus. Take care.